Welcome. It is Meeple Syrup time. Sorry that we weren't here last week. Quan Chai and I were at the Gathering of Friends, passing like two ships in the night, like literally. I walked out of the elevator, saw Quan Chai, said, hey, buddy, welcome, and then I left. That's pretty much it, right? That's what happened. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. And then Quan Chai <laughs> jetted off to go see uh, the factory at Buffalo Games. By the way, it was pretty cool, eh? Very cool. Just to see, Very like, cool. it is it is the last physical puzzle plant in America. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really neat to, to be able to see the manufacturing that is capable, that Americans are capable of, that still exists. Uh, yeah. It's not a lot, but it's still there. And so Buffalo Games is able to do some some good work there but today we're not here to talk about the gathering of friends we're not here to talk about gamma that's where cat is cats in reno gambling i don't know whatever you do in reno does it stay in reno now she's going to gamma and uh james is here all the way from australia hi james how are you hello i'm good how are you all good uh james where in australia are you that's a good question. Uh, you know, we've been traveling for the last couple of months. Uh, normally we're in Queensland, which is uh, like up on the Gold Coast. But at the moment, we're um, in a really interesting place. We're actually in Victoria. Um, we're just renting a property, which is right on top of the old gold fields. And so I'm, I'm really excited about getting out in my spare time and having a little look around. That's cool. Cool. And uh, Quan Chai is all hummy, but he's he's mitigating that with lots of towels. Oh, there goes the game. <laughs> sorry, guys. That's my hotel AC that's just started, and I'm really sorry there's no off. <laughs> no, no, it's Quan Chai. It's for sure Quan Chai. I know it's Quan Chai, because oh, when I mute Quan Chai, the buzzing goes away. Oh, okay. But he's an important person today. Anyway, <laughs> I'll so. try and fix it. I'll try. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> it's okay. Welcome to everybody out there watching the show, George and other people out there. If you're out there in Meeple Syrup land, please do chime in let us know you're there so we can say hello and we're gonna have a lot of questions today i hope about well james and quan Chai being here so kat what are we doing today so today what we're doing is one of the things that i see people ask all the time in the game design groups and that is how do i talk to an artist what do i do how do i get how do I get the best result out of talking to an artist? When do I talk to an artist? So we're just basically asking artists. Right. All the yeah, this is a masterclass on how to how to talk to an artist, right? Um, before we get started on that, James, can you tell us a little bit about your origin story? How did you get involved in art, specifically for games? Yeah, sure. Look, that's a really weird story because uh, I'd been an artist for many years in the uh, in the film industry and uh, in the theming industry. So I'd worked for you know a lot of big companies before, like uh, you know Paramount and Universal and Warner Brothers and stuff, and working on feature films. Um, and when when I sort of decided to quit that, when we had kids and um, you know I, I didn't want to do the eighteen hour days anymore, I was actually invited to do a um, uh, a visit because I, I built this Dalek. I built this full scale um, Genesis Dalek, uh, <laughs> as you do, right? And uh, <laughs> you know, being a props maker, so I got invited to the to the opening of this game store uh, in Adelaide, and they wanted me to bring the Dalek. So I I went along and I was inside and I performed and did all that stuff, right? Was that was that pretty Afterwards, common? Like, hey, hey, bring the Dalek. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, bring bring it along, you know. And they had like you know clone troopers and things like that as well. Right. So anyway, after the event, you know, I was looking around this store, and I was like, "What? What is all this stuff?" Right. Um, this was in 2016, and uh, the guy said, "Oh, you know, these are you know board games and stuff like this here." And he he just sort of handed me a pack of Magic the Gathering cards, and I was like, "What is this?" And he's like, "Oh, it's Magic the Gathering." And I'm like, "I've never it's, heard it's of it." It's cardboard before. crack. What it yeah, is. and he's like, well, there's like 20 million players. I'm like, ka-ching. Right? <laughs> hey, uh, here's something I can do, right? Here's something that I can, because um, I was looking for, for something else to do. You know, I'd been working in film. I'd been doing special effects. I'd been doing uh, art department for so many years. And I thought, well, I could stay at home and illustrate these things. I can make a game. So I started, I started literally just designing a game for myself. And, uh, and then I got it. I got my first job. Uh, I got a, somebody offered me a job and, and then it went from there. And so now like uh, six or seven or whatever years later, now I'm a game illustrator and I, I never even dreamed that it was a job, that it was a thing. 
And Quan Chai, what about yeah. your origin story? I know a lot of it, but a lot of people don't. So you started in like history. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I was a history. I, I mean, I, I, not, I was, I still am a history major. Technically I have a degree in history from uh, university of California in Davis. Um, and I also have a, a, a degree in illustration, but that came later. Uh, there was a year, the short version is there was a year between finishing my history degree and pondering what to do with my, um, with my life. And, uh, so I, I had a year, uh, that was kind of off. And then in that year, I kind of discovered board games. I spent a lot of time doing my own stuff with it, redesigns and artwork. I just, even now, like when I have free time, I feel like I gravitate towards board games as like a, as personal projects. Um, just redesigning things, making my own art for things, because I, I, I discovered more and more over time, of course, but especially back then that I really enjoy the intersection between art and like um, utility and board games are like you're using the art for a very express purpose. That, that's really exciting to me when you can decorate the things and the thing has a purpose. It's thematically important or it's mechanically important. Um, so that, yeah, like cool that problem still that. Yeah, I love that kind of problem solving. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I did some stuff that in that year and I uploaded it to Board Game Geek. So uh, BoardGameGeek.com, for those that don't know, is a very it's sort of a hub of like information about and forums for board games. And um, from there, through Board Game Geek's Geek Mail, in, in site Geek Mail system, I got, um, I got, Catacombs, which is the first like big game I did. Catacombs is a dexterity flicking game, and I um, I took that one game I did and like art school, <laughs> you know, figure pastels, and I went to Origins, which is a, a American gaming convention, and pitched myself to try and get more work. And from there, I think I I might have met I think I might have met you there, Sen, or yeah, at, least at the Gen Con that year. And then from there, you know, alongside. Uh, a lot of sort of mentors like Sen, uh, like Daryl, Andrews, um, and uh, those early projects that kind of like multiplied from there. Yeah, it was it was actually kind of funny that um, Catacombs was your big first game because I think I knew of you before that, and I don't know why. Well, that's the desired effect, but I'm sure that's <laughs> not true. <laughs> I think so, though, because Maybe. when, when I, Catacombs I, came up, it's like, oh, yeah, I know that art. No, I, I had I done one really? small game before Rumble. No, I'd done some games for a, a, a Belgian publisher called Flatline Games, uh, Rumble okay. in the House, and Twin Tin Robots. So I did know Twin Tin Robots. So those things came out just okay. like just around the same time as Catacombs, and then Catacombs okay. came out. Very cool. How about you, uh, James? So, um, James, for those of you who don't rec know James, this is James's face, but it, it's a drawing. <laughs> Just, yeah, this is me, honestly, I'm real. This is how good he is. <laughs> um, James, we're going to get into the the talk about, you know, how do we approach and communicate with artists and vice versa? How do artists communicate with, you know, publishers and designers? So how do you like to be approached? How do you like to be reached out to, James? Okay. Um, and look, this is a really good topic. I'm really glad that uh, you, you guys invited me on the show. So, you know, I thank you for that opportunity um, because it's, it's very much in the forefront for me, um, the communication between, you know, my clients and, uh, and myself and how they, how they relate, um, how they relate to me in the brief, uh, what they want, um, how they pay is very important, obviously, uh, timeframes, a whole lot of things like that. And a, a lot of confusion and a lot of, um, you know, quite often I've had arguments with clients uh, in the past uh, over things that are either uncertain or that they didn't read in my artist terms or uh, or they had some unreasonable expectation. Uh, there's, there's lots of things really. So I always, I always start out by giving them um, my artist terms because what I've done over the years, every time that I've run into a situation with a client where I think to myself, okay, I, I didn't mention that or that isn't covered uh, in my terms, I'll actually go and write a new little point in that in that so that um hopefully i mean not everyone does but um i'm hoping that the client will actually read through or at least have a browse through and then if they have any questions um we, we can discuss that before we actually get into the point of uh them sending money and me starting work like that 
So uh, I made a list for um, for talking today of a few things. So you know, perhaps um, Quan Chi, how how would you uh, approach it first off? Well, I feel like my methodology is a little more chaotic than the uh, bullet points that you've you are about to outline. <laughs> um, I feel like every client working with me is, um, uh, yeah, I, I I've developed somewhat of a list as you as you mentioned, um, sort of like a uh, healthy wall sort of a list of things. Um, and I'm sure a lot of ours probably intersect. I feel like it's taken me a long time for me personally to, to get that list together because, uh, I just, that's kind of how I am. <laughs> um, I'm probably, well, yeah, look, it's, it's, difficult, uh, it's difficult as an artist sometimes because, uh, this is the, this is, I guess the core and the key thing that I find with, uh, with art doing art for people is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that there is, this kind of, um, I guess, an, a sense that, that it's still a hobby in a lot of things. So that, you know, us as working as professional artists, you know, we really have to have a professional um, approach to working with people. And I think I was talking to Catherine about this before. I'll just mention this quick analogy that imagine if you went into, um, imagine if you went into a car shop and you needed your tire changed, right? And he, the guy said, yeah, okay, that's going to be X amount of dollars. And so he changes the tire on your car. And then you look at that tire and you say to him, well, you know, uh, I'm not really keen on that style of tire. I, I think I might, you know, like to have another one. So, you know, he changes that tire and he puts another tire on. And you have another look at it and you say, well, I don't really like the way that the letters are lined up against the wheel itself. Could you take the wheel off and then just move that tire around a little bit and then put it back on and, and let me see. So but at the end of the day, you know, he gives you this bill and you're like, well, no, you told me it was only going to cost this much. And so that's kind of like what I experience every day when I'm dealing with clients is that there's this endless, seems to be this kind of endless changes and well, can we do this or you know what I mean? Um, after, after the amount of time that you've quoted for has expired, um, you're then expected to work for free uh, to to get it into the into what's into that client's head. You know, so until it sort of matches with what their expectation is, you're kind of <clears throat> then expected to keep just keep working on it for free. And that could be days or I mean, I've done up to 22 hours or longer for free on a piece of artwork because it's still not exactly what they want. Whereas I'm thinking, well, shouldn't you be hiring me as an artist because you like the work that I do and, you know, you should be able to trust me to give you the best result uh, in, in what you see in my portfolio rather than micromanage me and, you know, keep wanting to basically do it yourself, but to get me to do it for you. So, yeah, that's, that's the key issue for me. Yeah, that's a big challenge, isn't it? Um, that's why yeah. I've stopped working on commission as well because I found that, people who commission art don't always understand how commissions work and no matter how how much or how little you explain this to them or how clear you are or how many bullet points there are or how many contracts they sign they're still mm. generally going to come back and go actually can you tweak this can you do that and then they get upset if you charge them more for it so mm. um yeah. it got to the point where it was it was for me far too draining and i just thought i'm just going to make what i make and if you like it you buy it and if you don't so mm. yeah. I, I so suppose be it. a big part of this conversation <laughs> we're having now is, hey, people who commission artists, please don't drain us. Please remember we're also people and this is this is a good way of doing it. So yeah, if, if you're approaching an artist, a really good thing to do is to actually ask them how they work and what's the best way that we can we can work together, right? So if someone yeah. said yeah. to you, Quancho, what would you say? So it's so tricky. Um, right. I feel, like it's, I feel like it's made less tricky by, for me personally, being as, as involved as I am, as I try to be in a face to face way in the industry. I feel like that makes it less tricky. It allows me to avoid pitfalls because, you know, there's just whispers of this, whispers of that or enough, you know. So I feel like I feel like um, as chaotic as my my ability to schedule myself, uh, organize myself can be. It's. Um, it's sort of um, buffered by me just making, you know, two or three con conventions a year, sort of mandatory and, and connecting with people. I feel like 
I, I, I agree. First of all, I agree with everything that uh, James is saying, Kat, uh, that you've mentioned too. A hundred percent. And I feel like any artist would agree with those things. Um, having only experience in the tabletop in industry, basically, like that's, that's all my experience is like from the ground up. I, um, I feel like um, it's a, it's a particular breed of illustrator that sort of has to uh, maneuver around companies that, that vary drastically in size and budget um and who is art directing it might be someone who has absolutely no experience with art direction that's coming from a field that has has not no 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 touchstones for that sort of thing and i feel like part of my job not the main part but definitely some portion of my job is sort of being uh a a translator for myself for mm -hmm. the, an everyman an ambassador for my own what i want to do um because i i do also feel like uh, a part of this industry, a part of the hobby in a way that I'm, I'm trying to be whatever the, you know, part of the cutting edge or part of the pioneer new spaces. And so, uh, so yeah, it, it is tricky because I have to, I want to just be an artist hundred percent of the time, but I feel like, you know, this winning smile has gotten me, you know, it's gotten me out of some trouble, uh, whether avoiding, you know, avoiding pitfalls, as I mentioned, or just being able to, talk to a publisher and having had met them last year so there's a there's a sense of connection there that 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 overrides some you know email some grading that might yeah. come out, you know. Look, this, is a, this is a really this is a really big uh <clears throat> really good point that you made there because you know what i've found over the years over the past uh god let me just say i'll just pull out a number out of my head 25 years okay that i've been working uh in film and stuff it was probably like 30 but that's, we won't talk about that but um <laughs> the ever what, what i noticed was when when i started communicating with people via email i started to run into problems because people would interpret what you're saying in a completely different way to your meaning which because you're not there face to face talking to them right and so they they can't see your facial expression they can't feel the vibration of what you're actually saying you see, so they just interpret whatever you've typed as, as bad when it's actually something that's good. And I've had massive arguments in the past uh, in the film industry with people who just look at an email that I've sent and say, well, uh, you know, and just, just go off their head. And I'm like, well, this is a positive thing that I've just sent to you. I'm meaning you really well in this, in this statement, but what, why are you taking it this way? So it's a really good point that you made that um, face to face is so much better. Uh, for communication than, than email, which can be interpreted uh, any way. And of course, being able to speak to people face to face, actually in the flesh is a real luxury. Um, you know, being sure. able to attend conventions, all of those sorts of things. But now we have, I mean, we're doing it right now. We have we have all of these other tools. Again, mm -hmm. something that is a privilege for many and a privilege you don't currently have, James, um, to actually be able no, to no, no. <laughs> on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking I should just animate that, right? <laughs> yeah, just like make the lips go, make it an animated GIF. Um, Dave Thomas is saying that people really don't understand the scope creep costs money, right? Mm -hmm. So both of you, I'll, I'll point this at Quan Chai first, and then uh, we'll ask you, James, as well. How do you stop revisions? Like revision costs just eats time, and it is literally the only way you actually make a living is by not doing revisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, you have a limit. And how do you set that limit? How do you stay within it while still keeping your customers happy? What do you do, Quan Chai? Um, I have, I think, I think a, it's two revisions per, in my contract, it's two revisions per stage. So it's like two sets of revisions for any given thing at the sketch stage. And then two revisions at the, colored rough stage and then you know and then once we get to the final i think it's like one i forget it there stipulates an amount of revisions i i feel like i had more trouble with revisions earlier on in my career and my career mm -hmm. is not that long, but you know earlier on i'd say that was more of an issue and i think part of that was um exacerbated by my inability to communicate well over email it's not funny we were just talking about emails yeah um and so i've i yeah, revisions suck, like period. Also, like iterations suck, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. a big a big company is always going to want like, let's get three examples because there's a committee that they want to show a bunch of stuff to and have <laughs> a thing about. But really, like nobody needs three, no one needs three iterations of something. 
you really want one iteration from me because that's what I do, right? But I'm going to make one and then two bad ones, and hopefully you pick the one that I like. I mean, that's – that's so I, I feel like part of being able to know your – client and know what their client is expecting is 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 morphing into a different illustrator for what client at least for me morphing into a different illustrator depending on the client um and i feel like the quickest way to avoid revision hell is to just be really communicative up front i i mean you know every illustrator has a horror story about revisions and i feel like i have like one and like one and a half and so i just feel either lucky or i i i don't know maybe you i just made I a good choice them. with the people that you've, I mean, the, the biggest thing yes. is if you get yes. the discovery phase right. Totally, that's exactly what Figuring out what you actually want. If you can get that right, then, um, and maybe that's that's what you've been doing. You've been getting that bit so right that you don't have, I mean, I've, I've got so many. Mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. when I was learning how to do the discovery. I'm sure James has millions with, you know, all that experience. But um, Yeah, I, exactly. I feel like client choice is like the first step in avoiding that. And like, Yes. There's just a feeling, even via email, that you can get with a client that just clearly doesn't is not an art forward or design forward company. And at least from my art, I don't want to work with a client like that because I know it's going to get hairy in there. <laughs> and that's a big thing, mm. right? Because they're hiring artists because of their art, as James mentioned and as you've mentioned as well. If you're hiring someone in particular because you like what they've done before, Bear in mind that that's that what thing. you're hiring them for. Like, mm -hmm. this is the expert yeah. in exactly the thing that you've asked them to do. And if you keep managing and picking at it, it's not art anymore. It's not actually them doing the thing. So if you choose someone, allow yourself to build trust in them. That's allow a great point. Let them do their job. The, the only thing I yeah. will add to that is that sometimes when you're dealing with IP, you oh, have yeah. to you have to draw the line somewhere literally <laughs> like oh that person needs their hair to be this long okay yes. it's this long mm -hmm. now that's fine mm -hmm. uh sorry james i cut you off so james what about you um oh. how do no, you okay. no I, I was just uh, i was just listening because uh yeah it's a good point you made about ip uh, i've worked with a lot of ip over the years um i'm currently doing um some work on the terminator um game i saw so, that uh, yeah i understand that's looking that, good um, Thanks. That they, they'll come back and say, "Well, you know, yeah, this this needs to be this way," or you know. Uh, oh, but, uh, James, this what, what kind of noise you? about? I'll be back. <laughs> come on now, revisions. I'll be back. Terminator. It was right there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'll stop that. Yes, it's, it's all right. <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say was, um, I don't mind the those things are there in IP, I, I would expect them. But um, if you're not familiar with IP for that particular IP, and then you do a piece of work and they come back to you and say, oh, well, that character has this. And I'm like, well, I didn't know that. And you didn't tell me that. Mm -hmm. That's when I kind of start to draw the line at like uh, Quan Chai was saying about revisions. It's like, unless I knew about it, unless you told me about it, um, or unless it was like really common knowledge, but yeah, those sorts of things can be kind of uh, frustrating. So then then that's when you sort of have to start negotiating. Um, I'm doing a piece right now for a really big um, civilization game called uh, Chronicle. And they've already got all of their artwork for the whole game, and it looks really good. I mean, the, the, all of the pieces that I've seen look fantastic, right? But they wanted uh, something spectacular on the cover. And, um, and I've been working on this for maybe three weeks now, you know, um, and when I, when we sort of had got halfway through, they decided that they liked it so much that they wanted to change it <laughs> to something else, <laughs> you know, because they were like, well, this looks great, but so let's, let's just add a whole bunch of stuff oh. and change it around. And I'm like, well, you know, well, that's going to, you know, it's going to cost extra now because I'm changing from what you gave me in the brief to something that now you are, that you've made up because you you've seen something that you liked and you know look that's great but fortunately they were good enough to sort of say okay yeah we understand that so mm -hmm. i had to then re -quote it. i requoted it um and got some extra cash um there's a bit of micromanaging going on with this uh, i think because i tend to work a little bit more detailed than say um quan Shai works in a, in a very almost abstract way sometimes in in your art if you know what i mean like um 
his art's very beautiful. Uh, it has a sense all of its own. Like like each artist, you can sort of say, well, okay, that's Cuttington. That's this. You know what I mean? You, you can pick a piece of your work because it has a, it has a color and vibrance which is really beautiful. Um, and I don't know of anyone else who does that, right? Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't want to attempt something like that. Uh, but when, when I do it, I, I tend to kind of over illustrate everything and I, you know, I go into little details and then I find what happens is that the, uh, the client will say, well, can we, can we just rotate that foot about three degrees to the right? And I'm not joking. This happened just in the last couple of days. Could we reduce the size of the woman just by like 3% and then, um, we want to brighten up this side here a couple of millimeters. So, yeah, I think when you move away from something that's a lot more abstract and a lot more, um, I'm, I'm going to use the word arty here because like I, I went to fine art school. I went to fine art school and I, I'm, I'm a painter and a sculptor and, you know, I really enjoy um, y using that sort of medium, right? But illustration for me has become very kind of, um, fine in terms of detail and things and so do you find Quan Chai, that that you have less of that micromanagement because of that i feel like that the thing that i do i think i feel like as if i can possibly push the hands and feet out of the composition so you don't even see them <laughs> oh, totally the same. Yeah. oh so you're, you're rob layfield, you're layfield. Also, tilt the face so it's just a pro a hard profile to the side <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. I, get, I um, Putting down a really broad stroke of paint, digital paint or otherwise, in a, one of my compositions and starting there and sort of saying to the client, like, this is this is the style. It does allow for, you know, it allows for me to noodle around less with little fingers and hands and, you know, like highlights and stuff. Um, I, I do. I already paint that way anyway, but it, it does it does mean that there is a forgivingness to dialing in on something that, whereas like, like a lot of your covers are uh, scenes in perspective, um, uh, objects, people that have to make sense mm -hmm. a certain way. So someone who's not even has no background in art, but is art directing will be able to pick it apart in a way that's more literal, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're a lot more literal, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, that whereas, um, you know, I kind of uh, would, would, I, I really would love to be able to do what you do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so that you can, you can get away from that. But everyone comes to me with kind of, um, we want to, we want to do, uh, you know, historical, like it's a historical cover or it's a very specific theme with, with characters. Mm -hmm. Like I always have to do ships for some reason, right? There's always like boats and pirates and oh, they're hard. Um, oh, I don't know, but yeah, you end up, I ended up going in and doing like all of this very fine detail and stuff. So that, mm -hmm. that does make it a little harder. And yeah. You both actually generally work as, as digital artists at the moment, right? Because that's another thing that um, that people may not understand is that when you're talking to a digital artist, I suppose, yes, you can ask them to change a particular layer or shift a particular thing around. But um, not all the artists that you're going to be working with work digitally. So if you're asking someone mm. to paint you something or draw you something physically, you can't then go, oh, can you no. rotate that foot three degrees? Or could I make this this woman smaller or whatever? Because it is, it's, it, it is there. That's how it is. And um, that's one of the things that I think people need to bear in mind when they're commissioning someone is how that person works and what revisions can actually encompass. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, yeah. Sorry. One thing that I have been doing in the last few years is um, flattening my layers as I paint. I think everyone, by you know, for for utility sake, if you're if you're working in Photoshop to paint a, a, a box cover, you're working in layers so you can mess around with opacities and move things around and change sizes. But as someone who uh, also like James, I, I'm a painter, started with oil paints and acrylics. It, the permanence of it is a commitment to a composition. It's a commitment to a vision. And working digitally means that I can constantly go back and change it. But flattening my layers and uh, Moving forward does two things for me. One, it makes me feel like I'm painting in a, in a real sense. And also, if you're using the right brushes, it can really emulate, you can, you can really emulate real analog experience a little bit better. It can look better, I think, because you're painting into your own paint as opposed to painting under layer, over layer, under layer. And also it means the client um, can't go back and 
it doesn't happen often, but it has happened where like someone with all, the, if you give a client too many layers, they'll just, um, you know, kind of fudge it up and, and mess around with it in a way that's like not fun at, in the end game, in the end step uh, of, the, yeah. of the process. So yes. um, I've, I've found, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wonder if my clients wonder if I'm just lying when I say like, yeah, actually I have no layers. I know I was <laughs> working layers, but now they're gone. Um, because in, in the last 20% of a project, I just flatten the layers because I feel like it makes for a better, more punchy, more interesting composition. Oh, same. Yeah. Like I, I've started doing that in the last couple of years as well. You know, before mm -hmm. clients would always be asking me for layers. I'm not, I'm not giving you the layers. Yeah. You know, I'm not <laughs> yeah, giving you I'm not, oh, I've got like 500 layers here, right? You're not having this one. Um, so <laughs> so what I would do is uh, these days I'll do a black and white and, um, you know, I'll do a, a value composition uh and sometimes i cheat a little bit and i'll just go ahead and just do the color and then i'll just you know switch it to black and white and scribble a bit on it just so that i can show them um but once i once they lock in that black and white um that's it i'll, I'll switch the color i'm flatten my layers and i'm painting mm -hmm. on top of this right um now i did this i did this with the piece that i'm working on because they had already improved the cover and um did the did the color for them which they loved and then they said look we want to reduce the woman by five percent and i'm like oh it's flat um so it was it so was really difficult shape out and i really had to like cut her out and start painting behind her and that that's oh, really no. hard you know, making yeah, it smaller do. as well making it big is all good like yeah sure cut oh, it out cool, right? really fine, but yeah yeah you can just go in and cut around that but um yeah making it things smaller or shifting them you suddenly have things behind yeah i'm gonna fix all of that um dave's actually got another good comment here saying um we've only hired a few artists but we try to make sure the contract is really clear on how long we have to give feedback and the number of revisions allowed before we have to pay more and that dave that is a really good one because right. having time frames like having those things actually stuck there that really one artists i mean we, we do tend to get distracted and take a bit longer all that kind of thing yep fair but also like yeah. we can't just sit there with this idea half born in our heads waiting for six months for you to reply like we have other jobs to oh, do we need to absolutely calibrate so putting that time yeah, in yeah. There, that's brilliant yeah i think yeah, i think that's I've a got that situation right now um mm -hmm. i've got the same thing with the, with the client where uh, you know i've put in the um piece of artwork and i'm waiting for a reply and that was like a week ago and, you know, mm. I'm like, well, I've booked you in for this week. Yes, you know this is I mean? your time. I want to get, I want to get paid. Um, <laughs> I need to finish it by Friday so I can get paid and pay the rent, right? It's a, it's yeah. a simple uh, equation that, that people just think, okay, I'll get back to them whenever we feel like it. And I'm like, uh, I haven't actually booked in any other work um, yeah. this week. Like, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, this is, so it, it, is, it is a very interesting thing. Like, I don't, I don't think people think about freelancers the way that they mm. maybe should. Uh, so... For all of you out there who are freelancers, like most of us are, uh, we're not, you know, wholly funded by some company who pays our, our wages. Uh, I book time. And if you don't fill that time, I book somebody else in it. And if you said you're going to give me that time and you don't come to that time, oh boy, that's like a loss of like several hundred thousand, you know, it can be thousands of dollars for any of us when we were, were giving that time to you. Mm -hmm. I could have booked somebody else in that time. Uh, so... I mean, this is why doctors have cancellation fees. We're not mm. doctors. We don't do that. But well, the same with tradespeople. It like, should feel like that. No, we get, we right? get to charge four hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, what do what do you guys think about contracts? Um, James, you had mentioned that you have like a list of of bullet points that you yeah. communicate. Yeah, I was How do you do that? I actually send it to you. Um, I was trying to send it to you on Facebook uh, at the same time while I was oh. talking, but it wouldn't let me attach the PDF. Um, oh, no, that's yeah. okay. We'll, we'll so, get it later. We'll get it later. Yeah, I'll, but I'll Quanti, send it to you later Quanti and I want to take. We want to take notes on what you what you say. <laughs> yes, we do. Quantra's like, yes, please. <laughs> notes. So, um, George's question, I think, actually leads into this yes. in a way that I think would work quite well for the for the conversation at this point. Um, so, when approaching an artist, what materials should I have prepared for that initial interaction? And yeah, I know so as a designer or publisher, George, right? Yeah, I know when we talk about vocab, we're going to go into a little bit more information about what those things mean, but it's it's useful to know. I mean, for me personally, I want to have a brief and uh, ideally a mood board. What do you guys look for? Quantra? 
Uh, yeah, a brief uh, mood board. Um, a nice compliment goes a very long way with me. Um, <laughs> you look great today, by the way. Thank you, thank you. That's it can, how I get it doesn't have to be work. a vocal. It can be an email too. It can be a. Um, I, yeah, I um, feel like man. as much as, as, much as possible, <laughs> the, uh, the the client knowing why they chose me as an artist is important. Um, so for it any artist, ego, but... ego stroke. Okay, got it. Ego. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stroke. Tell me the <laughs> tell me your favorite thing I've done. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but but I, I I also happen. I think every artist has like a a style and a half or two styles that kind of work in. So in that range, um, it's useful to know what brought the client to the table. Mm -hmm. Maybe what other thing that you did or or person they spoke to, right? Because that gives you an idea of like what 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 realm of the industry are they coming from and what do they need. Um, that's really helpful. Um, uh, mood board is really helpful. Uh, and uh, I had a client, one of, one of my, one of the best clients, I, I'll just shout him out, Nick at Bitewing Games. He comes up with a very professional PDF that has goals, not just for the art, but for like where this product needs to hit certain, you know, sizes and uh, uh, shelf appeal, where it's, where it's fitting into their overall, um, uh, product line for the year like these are all things that they're adjacent to what i'm doing as an artist but the more i know and understand these things the better of an artist i can be for him and right. i can know like okay well these are the deadlines that are really important because he needs to hit these otherwise you know x y and z yeah. so yeah um mm -hmm. as much as possible getting all the information is is the best the best material is just like a fully fleshed out idea and it doesn't have to be that the game is done or the project is done or, or that the rules are already set in stone but it's just like knowing artistically where the client wants to get to is important. And, and, and to, to pair with that, I feel like a really good client um, has a lot of good questions. Actually, my mm -hmm. the graphic designer I work with, Bridget, the, our, our little partnership, she, it's actually something she said, so I'm stealing it. Sorry, Bridget. Um, but she <laughs> says like a good client has really good questions um, that you need to answer as a visual artist. Right. So, yeah. um, and that, and that, that, that means that a, but conversely, a, a bad client doesn't have a lot of questions, but has a lot of like orders or like mm -hmm. things they need fulfilled. And it's not really a question like what does the art, what can the artist visually bring to answer the question that we have about our project, which is I need a game about the city builder. That's like a fresh take that looks, you know, this that's in this color palette um, for a, uh, a an older audience, like not not a children's, you know, so like these are questions that I that excite me as an artist. Was that Rolling Heights? That sounds like the Rolling Heights brief. <laughs> that wasn't, but that is exactly. <laughs> it. I, was just, I was just talking to Josh about, yeah, Rolling Heights. Um, but yeah, answer a lot of questions. And I feel like, uh, yeah, so conversely, a bad client is one that it just feels like they're holding my hand as I draw. And like, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, like James, I also, my, my worst story is worst. one in which a client wanted me to rotate by degrees the position of a, the head of a knight. I just like, <laughs> the only project I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I can't. I really can't satisfy you anymore. So, um, yeah. yeah, I would say that. I would say that uh, those are some of the those are some of the things for me. I think. Yeah. Um, just sorry before you jump in, James. One thing that um, I learned from my friend who is a graphic designer is to have a really good onboarding questionnaire and to make it sufficiently detailed that it's going to give you everything you need, and sufficiently long that it'll put off your time wasters. <laughs> really interesting technique because if someone's just gonna muck around or they don't know the answers to those things they can't hire you yet yeah they they don't have enough information to actually it? usefully engage you right and so it helps them and it helps you i think it's a really oh, it was a really clever technique. yeah we do the same thing with development we have a whole development questionnaire that guides them through our process and if they don't fill it out we actually can't work with them because we don't know what they want so James, mm. what about you? What do you like when people are communicating to you? Do you want like the big ego stroke like Quan Chai does? <laughs> well, look, no, I, I've never been into kind of like the, the whole ego thing. I, um, I'm pretty down to earth. I'm pretty old school in the way that I approach things. So I, yeah, having worked in the film industry with, with so many people from like really well-known, um, you know, actors and directors and producers to like, I, I kind of just, I treat everybody exactly the same and and i don't put myself above anyone so I'm, I'm not really into any ego stroking at all but i it's really nice sometimes when 
perhaps a client comes along and says, you know, I really love the cover of Feed the Kraken. Uh, I, I love that what you did on that. Um, and, you know, would you do a piece for me? And, and that's really nice. I'm like, oh, yeah, wow, I did do that. Um, you know, and, and there's that little bit of appreciation, like Quancha said, it's, it's nice, you know, to get that feedback. So um, the, the things that I ask my clients for when I, when I first get a, an email or, um, or a Facebook message is, you know, could you just describe what you're looking for? What's, what's your vision in your head? What do you see? Uh, what, what are you wanting to express on the cover? And do you have any examples of uh, things that you've seen that, that kind of match that, that, that give you the same sort of uh, inspiration or the same sort of vision? Uh, so I get them to send me some examples that just pulled off the internet of, of things that, that kind of look like the direction that they want to go. So that then what I do is I will become an interpreter, like Quan Chi was saying, uh, in, a, in a visual artist way and say, well, I think that what you're actually looking for is this. And I'll give them a very rough brief. And sometimes that can be like a, a composite. Like I'll chuck some things together, like a, like a composite and go, is this kind of what you're talking about? And they go, yeah, that's, that's what we're looking for. And, and I'm like, okay, well, then I'll work up a rough for you based on that. So what I really like to get from clients is, is a brief. Um, so a little outline of the game. I don't want to know anything about the mechanics because I don't care, honestly. Um, that might sound rough, but I really don't want, you know, a 60-page PDF on the mechanics of the game. Um, but that's, that's not what I want. What I want is um, a description of what they want to see, uh, some examples, and, um, and then, you know, then we'll start working on the roughs. So I, I really like it to be a little bit more loose, but have enough information so that I'm not going the wrong, wrong way. Um, now, I did a... I stupidly did a piece for um, from an RPG crowd just recently, um, you know, like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, like a group of people who get together and they've yeah, been like playing a, for years. A party. And, you know, they, they want to have their yeah, they want to have their little party picture. So I stupidly said yes to, to doing one of these, and then I got this like ah, I don't know how many pages. It must have been like thirty page PDF of every it had like every character every character's trait um it had um the details of exactly what went on their outfits what their hair had to look like the length of their hair the color of their hair um it went down to the descriptions of the specific bracelets that they wore um what the necklace looked like it was just a hor horrible horrible horrific experience that i will never do again um and <laughs> The thing is that they, they had this budget that I originally quoted for, which is what I would normally quote for a piece. And once I got the, the information and looked at it, I just had a heart attack. And I said, look, you know what? There has to be some compromises made between what you're wanting, which is going to take me three or four weeks, and what I've quoted on, which would take me two weeks. And they're like, no, mm. we, we, don't want to, we don't want to compromise on any quality. It has to be what we've seen on your website. And I'm like... Well, to do that, like you've got 10 characters here. Now I charge a base rate of basically $300 for a character. I said, that's $3,000 just for the characters, right? And you've got 10 of them. And then you've got the whole background with a ship and all these other items in here. And you're offering me 1800 and expecting that I can do, it was like about $4,000 worth of work for $1,800. Um, yeah, so, so, so and that was an example of being like micromanaged, yeah, uh, to a yeah. state where I, I wasn't even involved, I felt in it. I was just like, like once yeah. I said, like they're holding your hand as you're drawing mm -hmm. until, until yes. they're satisfied, and they're not going to pay you the rest until like you, you've satisfied them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the very first um commission work that I did when I was 17 or so was um for an RPG. And I had exactly the same. I got all of that stuff specked out for me. Everything was on there and they want this and they want it at this angle and they wanted line work only and it was all to be done on paper. And um, the the huge list that I got, I got um, $45 per finished piece. Um, mm. Yes, I was 17, so that was a minute ago, but $45. Um, now I really want to go back in time and slap myself for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, I did that for a little while and obviously $45 paid my, my rent for the week back then. Um, mm. But 
it's nice to know exactly what someone wants, but sometimes they can just go too far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example of, of going yeah. too far. Um, yeah. I guess really just to answer the question is to, to provide enough information for the artist that, um, that they can get a sense of what you're looking for and then trust that artist. If yeah. you're hiring someone like Quan Chai or myself or, or Vincent Dutre, uh, you know, and I've had conversations with Vincent before about, you know, when I've been frustrated with stuff, like I'll shoot him a, a message and say, look, do you, do you ever do this? Or, you know, have you ever had this experience? And what, what happens? What, what do you do? And he's mm. like, no, no, <laughs> I don't do that. Yes, no. He's very, you know, he was very specific saying, I don't do that. And he doesn't give you layers. You know, obviously he draws. Oh, yeah. No. Right. Um, yeah. So like, I, I just kind of laughed. And <laughs> so I thought, well, well, what then why, why are people expecting other artists to do the same thing? Like, you know, mm. we should all be working the same way. Jason's yeah. question is actually quite you interesting. Trust, trust that artist to give you, you know, the best thing that they, and this is what we do, right? We you yeah. should trust that artist if you've chosen them to give you a piece. I mean, if I was going to choose Vincent Dutre or, or Quan Chai to do a cover for me, I would just say, this is what I want. Go, Go to for it. it. Mm -hmm. Go for it, right? Because I know right. you're going to do a great job, right? You, you have to trust them on that. Um, <laughs> that's, my, that's really my best advice. Yeah, Dave has a really good point here. He says, I feel like if I'm hiring an artist, I'm doing it because I want not only their skill, but a portion of their creativity as well. And I'll, I'll say, just as somebody who has hired Quan Chai in the past, I just let the guy do what he wants. Mm. <laughs> because it comes out awesome every time. That's when you get the best <laughs> stuff, right? It is. Right? Yes, it is. Like, that's when, really when, you let, when you let the artist go, you know, mm. you can get stuff that you're just not expecting. Yeah, Rather and it is. doing it's, the layout yeah. for them. You know, and saying, I've yeah. had people sort of give me a layout and go, this is what I want you to draw. And it's already like drawn out. And I'm like, okay, so what do I do? I just draw my numbers here. Right. <laughs> um, Can you just oh, change Kat. the yeah. 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 Just yeah. zhuzh it up. Zhuzh it up a bit. Yeah. Jason Tam, um, a question that uh, Kat was getting to, asks, can you tell me more about the partnership that you have with your graphic designer? I think this is aimed at Quan Chai, about you and oh, Bridget yeah. in Delicato. Oh, Bridget. Awesome Bridget, Bridget in Delicato is a talented graphic designer who I've had the pleasure of working with on a lot of projects. Um, you know, there's like, there's your Eno Tools of the world, and who was like an illustrator and a graphic designer. So we're just trying to recreate that in the aggregate with two people oh i see it's a it's a two person uh, you, aggregate yeah, to meet, one, meet the skills know, cool. of one person um no yeah she's a graphic designer um that i work with she's out of philly we, we just came back from the uh doing the the gathering together and uh i i i it's really a pleasure to work with her for two main reasons one is that um it's a familiar face on every project so i don't get to work with on every project but if i could i would have i would it would I'd rather just work with her on every project because usually the art director on a on a board game is going to be the graphic designer. Sometimes there's a project manager, but usually it's the graphic designer who's taking the files, putting copy and text and icons on it and getting it ready for the printer. Um, so if I already know that person and we have a good um, flow, then it just makes the project go quicker. Um, and secondly, being a freelancer, touching back on something earlier is just like a very it feels very lonely at times because you're just mm. so good. Like everyone you're you're just pioneering your own space out in the wild west and uh you uh to have someone to check in with regularly on projects is has been really like a, a huge change in my workflow um and she probably would say the same exact thing about me but even more so but no, just, <laughs> um yeah so that's my that's that's bridget and i i i feel like um Having someone to check in with, whether you have a graphic designer or another illustrator or a group of whether virtually or locally that you is doing like minded stuff. You know, for me, it's sometimes it's only, it's just been like getting to know Sen, like designers and other folks. They're not illustrators, but we're all in the same very, very specific niche hobby board game space. So it feels like um, I'm, I'm kept afloat in a way, you know, like, mm -hmm. like all the things we're talking about on the stream today, which is a, a lot of it. A lot of it is stuff I, when I graduated from art school, we we were, I, there was a lot of horror stories about getting nickel and dimed in proje on projects. And it does happen. There are bad clients out there. Um, and it was really scary because like, so like my first contracts were so like, I was like really like in the weeds on contracts with, uh, with clients because I didn't want to get like screwed over, you know? And, you know, regardless of that, it might still happen, but 
getting to know other designers, getting to know other illustrators in my specific industry, which is tabletop gaming, has made me feel um, less scared and also more ready to uh, to bat away possible, you know, potential like bad clients. So I feel like I feel like um, although quite a lot of our <laughs> chats today are, are about like bad stories. I feel like a lot of them can be avoided uh, quite easily. And there's a lot of actually, especially in board games, at least right now, who knows? I can't speak for the future, but like up in my past and up to the present, it's been like a very delightful experience working with almost every client. Um, and part of that is being able to be involved in a community that is sort of niche and mm -hmm. has a lot of familiar faces and it's very nice people. And uh, yeah, so I'm and sorry. That's, I that's what we're aiming to do, right? We're aiming to build relationships. So, um, I yes. think a lot of people confuse the roles of graphic designers and illustrator mm. artists. And I think it would be really nice if we can just quickly clarify this. So generally the illustrator or artist is the person who does the pretty pictures and the graphic designer mm -hmm. is the person who takes the pretty pictures and puts them into the functional context of whatever it is that they're building. So if it's a board game, for example, and it's, it's got cards, the, artist will be the one who does the pretty picture on the card and the graphic designer is the one who puts that into the card in such a way that the everything else is legible functional if you hold the card in your hand the symbols are legible they're they're where they should be and all of that kind of thing can you add to that that is yeah, exactly like, um, i think yeah. the graphic designer role um often uh, involves a lot of things you know it can involve some illustration um often a graphic designer would be doing uh, say a a card layout so they might be doing uh borders or they might be doing the um the visual layout of perhaps a um a rule book you know so they might have to do logos titles um banners there's a whole lot of things that kind of fall under a um a graphic designers because i originally did graphic design uh, at university for a year and then i went on to do fine art for four years and so i got to do kind of both of those things and see the difference and when i was doing graphic design it was all about layouts and um overlays and kind of you just basically uh, visual visual organization you know and yeah. um a lot of people confuse these two roles or conflate these two roles and some of that is because a lot of us do a lot of the mm -hmm. the, the overlap mm -hmm. but um, one of the things, as I understand it from my graphic designer friends, is that the graphic designer does that artists generally don't do, is prepping the files for print and understanding all of that side of it. Whereas if, you're, if your job is entirely artist, your, your aim is to create the visual things that the graphic designer then makes into that, so completes into that package. Um, I think that there are a lot of other things that both of these roles do, and the art direction was an interesting one. I didn't ever really think of the graphic designer as being the art director because I've generally seen the you know, graphic designer and artist and art director here, but that's a really good point, Conchai, in games, that's quite that's quite common, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, so one, one of... I just um, noticed that, you know, Tools jumped on. Hey, Ian, how you doing? Yes. I was hey. going to say, just be mentioned, and Ian was like, yeah. hey. He heard, his, he heard his name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Yes, <laughs> Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. No, um, stop saying it. <laughs> well, I mean, what's going to happen? What's the worst that's going to happen? Oh, right? that's the, that's the worst gonna happen. Oh, yeah, but Ian O'Toole is one of those guys who can kind of do a lot of that work himself. But even even O'Toole could use a little help every now and then from oh, yeah. a, a, a good art director. Uh, like Matt Paquette does a lot of art direction now. Mm -hmm. He's he's got a lot of other graphic designers under his under his wing, and so he takes on the role of the art director and then parcels out work to them and gets the illustrators yeah, and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So it's it's a really good uh, a really good gig I think um, because it yeah. does take that person who can communicate between the idea people and the creatives who are doing the work. Yes. And sometimes those two people don't talk well to each other. So let's get on to vocabulary. Yes. Um, we only got a couple minutes left, but let's let's do this. What are some words that you wish that people knew what they actually meant when they said them to you? Let's start with James. Art words. Oh, art words. Oh, okay. <laughs> God, I don't if know. Can Poncho, can you... Okay, okay. 
I'm, I'm just, thinking. I can quickly run over the words that we've covered already yeah. and give them a, a definition yeah. while you're thinking. So we've covered brief. Brief is basically an outline of what you want, and it should be brief. It's not a novel. This is this is a concise, clear set of instructions of what you want your artist to complete. A mood board is if you imagine you have a pin board on your wall and all the photos and images and and pieces of fabric and all of those sorts of things that give you the feeling you want this game to have that's a mood board and you can do that in pinterest you can do it physically you can just collect a bunch of different postcards you can go to anywhere and just grab things that make you think of the feeling you want the game to have so that your artist has something to inspire them mm -hmm. a sketch is generally something that you could imagine someone doing just with a pencil so it's a quick it's usually something that's done very quickly and gives you an outline of what they want. Mm. A rough is similar to that, but it's often slightly more developed and it'll give you some sense of motion and the things that you'd expect to have. And a composite is often something that would be done using several different photos or other images, just again, potentially from the mood board to give you, for example, a basic layout of how the cover of the, the, book, the book would look or the front of the box or a card layout or those yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. Has that given and the composite, other ideas? Really, uh, the composite is really important, I think, too, because uh, that's the way that I tend to work with clients. It just allows me to very quickly show them uh, an idea of, okay, is this a direction that you want to go without me having to literally draw a whole character in there? I will just kind of compass a whole lot of stuff and then scribble over the top and yeah, maybe put some pointers yeah. and things and go, yeah, does that, does that kind of like look what you're thinking? so yeah composites are great like that i mm. i tend to have trouble i don't know about you quan Chai, but uh i've got a really old um tablet i've got a wacom intuos 3 which i which i bought when i was working on house of wax i think it was oh hey uh, cool. maybe like 17 years ago uh, it's, i'm still using it but it's got issues but the the problem for me is the disconnect um, I don't have a I don't have a tablet like a Cintiq that I can look at where I'm drawing. So mm. I'm drawing down here, but I'm up here at the computer. So there's this disconnect. So I find that I can't draw. I can't draw digitally. Um, so what I do is I kind of I um, I scribble. I just kind of like I scribble, but I can't sort of just sit down with a piece of paper and just draw on it. And that's my piece where I'm actually uh, my pen is, you know, I'm looking where I'm drawing. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that's why I tell people that I don't actually draw. I, I compose it and then I draw over the top on the computer. But I can't just sort of sit down and just just draw because um, I don't have a Cintiq to be able to to do that digitally from you know what I'm used to doing as an artist from a fine artist is, is drawing on paper or canvas. Yeah. Yeah. Same. So composites are great, um, you know, and then I get to work over the top sort of uh, as best I can with the with the Wacom tablet. Yeah. Nice. Oh, Ian's mentioned um, Art Deco versus Art Nouveau. Yes, sure. <laughs> yes please, please get those if, correct. If you're going to tell us that you want something in a particular style, just spend five minutes Googling it and really looking at what it actually means. Or I'll supply pictures of what you think is Art Deco. That way we know that you mean Art Nouveau. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Nouveau is elves. Deco is dwarves. End of story. Done. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of any particular uh, terminology that uh, I feel like you 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 were succinct in your in your definitions there. That was that's pretty good, Kat. Thank you. Um, I would yeah, say personally. <laughs> I, I would say personally, um, the word magenta and the color magenta should be not a scary thing for publishers to approach i yeah. i feel like you can never have <laughs> this is a common theme with magenta with but i mean <laughs> also also I, by I, the I way listened to your ludology i think where you were talking about magenta, <laughs> and i was like yes we want more magenta give us the magenta mm. sometimes i'll peruse the email and i'll look for the keyword magenta because i was <laughs> like oh no it's like is it too much magenta i don't know um i've, oh, man, I've, I, can I've never, I can never use it there's, there's no magenta in historical stuff right I can't, there, I can't, there I can't until used. until i get hired and then all of a sudden there's magenta <laughs> something historical and they're like ah buddy <laughs> i don't Someone know said i don't know they want to hear about limitations 
Okay, we'd love to hear more about limitations, but I think we are out of time. We're only out of time if James and Quench, I say we're out of time. We can do this. Yeah, I all go to LA. <laughs> so, so limitations. What do you, what do you mean by that, Jason Tam? Oh, in the meantime, Ian's brought in some technical terms like bleed and safe margins oh, and those yes. things. Well, yes, that that's because Ian graphic. comes from the graphic design yeah. side of mm -hmm. things, but that's, they are really important. They are. Um, and this this is just me being on my on my on my uh, practical soapbox. And I loved it, James. By the way, uh, when he said that you built the Dalek, because I'm huge into practical effects. Like I I oh, I cool. do not like digital effects at all. And this is one yeah, that I no. get all the time when people are saying, oh, yeah, I'm a graph designer. And they are because they make, you know, electronic files and things like that, but they don't do print. And so they don't understand bleed and cut lines and margins and safeties and all these things that we talk about in print. Um, they just don't get it. And they make these things and they wonder why all the stuff is cropped, all the crap. It's because you don't know how to make it. You don't know how to get your files print ready. Uh, so on the graph design side, yeah, get somebody who is competent at print, at print, just jet, at print. Anything that prints. So have, they, have they made a book? Have they made a pamphlet that's actually been printed before? If they have, they're probably pretty good for 80% of the stuff you have to do in, in card and board. And 100% of the stuff you have to do pretty much in, in role-playing games. But then once you get into physical construction of like, punch board and stuff like that. You got to get somebody who might know a little bit more about that. Your manufacturers will also walk you through a lot of that because they're, they want to make sure they're not wasting material as well. So there you go. Oh, here you go. David wants to know about CMYK. <laughs> what, what, what is that by the way? I've never, I've never heard. No, I don't know anything about CMYK. So it's, uh, I know CYK, no. but Quanch, I definitely know is CMYK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone no, else RGB, Troy, Troy's already got that. that. Troy covered that. So, can you can you put up Troy's comment? <clears throat> oh yeah, you get CMYK, so M is important. It is. Yeah. M is really important. You heard it here from Troy. That's right. M is super important. Um, <laughs> if you don't use M, you your your print doesn't look quite right. <laughs> it's gonna look uh, a bit yeah. Because it's one of the four. <laughs> it's one of the four inks. That's what CMYK is about. It's it's when you do four color process printing, you use four different colors of ink basically. And it's just percentages of that ink that make up all the colors. And uh, if you don't use the M, then you're gonna, you're gonna lose something of, of the, well, the ready tones anyways. Uh, but if you, if you want, if you don't want to, that's fine. Cause there are definitely things that have 0% in M, but. Uh, oh, so your abilities, equipment, and what clients um, want out of you. Okay, so that's what Jason was meaning by limitations. So is there something you cannot do illustratively or painterly or anything like that um, where you say, that's out of my ballpark, I'm going to have to know about or I'm going to recommend that you talk to somebody else? Like, Quanchai, what, what's your limitations? What is a hard no for oh, you? What do you pass on? So many. Uh, I can't mock up a 3D box, so Bridget or Ian works in like Adobe what's the 3d i don't know like, there's, there's a bunch of um peripheral things that i should be able to do better like maybe maybe some motion would be useful right some motion mm -hmm. graphics um mocking up not not mocking quite things. Things. really bad at that um i am bad at giving the client layers we talked about that um, i don't think that's a bad thing actually <laughs> no i uh to, to, to answer the question more seriously i i think i think one of the reasons why i going back to something we discussed earlier that I, I feel like uh, quickly overworked or burnt out is because I feel like um, I want to do everything. I want to do every project that comes across my desk. I want to say yes to the emails and I want to do like a million different styles and themes and approach different cool cultural touchstones that are made into a board game, some historical stuff. I want to do it all. And so um, I feel like, uh, at least for me personally as an artist, I can jump around style wise a little bit. And I really have a lot of fun having a lot of variety in my art diet. So being a board game illustrator is like just amazing for that because every single game is different and it, every single project's needs are can vary. Um, Didn't you say that uh, 2023 was the year of saying no? That's right. <laughs> I did, did say how that. did that go, by the way? How, how many no's have you managed? I mean, honestly, I say no, like to, I have to say no to like 90% of the projects that come to me. And, 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 and sometimes I can't even respond. Like I don't even get to the bottom of my 
inbox to respond because folks are just so generous and kind and they want to get information about, you know, their game or their, their possible, possibly working on their game. And it's, and it's, 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 it's amazing. I, I, it's a, like a pinch yourself moment every day, honestly. Yeah, Scott Rogers here, who is one of my former Ludology compatriots. He's saying that it's great to hear from more artists, more interviews with artists in the future, that they're so important to creating board games in the same way that artists are integral to creating comic books and illustrated books. Um, and so many of the hits that we have really do owe a lot of the success to the artists that are involved. And so we need to treat artists as partners in the game creation process, not just a hired pencil. Love it. No, I, I love it. That. I mean, you, you buy the you buy the games off the shelf. Well, I do. I mean, I only buy games that look good, right? I'll, I'll go into the, the game shop. Um, and even if the game might be fantastic, if it doesn't have good artwork, I won't buy it because it's something I want to like, I want to look at, I want to experience, I want to put it on my shelf. Um, and, you know, this thing's going to, you've got good artwork on a game. It's, it's what sells that game forever for its lifetime. Right. So it's, mm -hmm. you create that artwork once and uh, yeah, it's, it's the marketing tool that you're using to, um, yeah. to advertise that product. Right. So yeah. it really does deserve to have that, um, that mm -hmm. respect. The for face that of your game. It's so, the thing that everyone thinks of when they, when they think about your game, they picture the way that it looked in the ad that they saw. They think about the table presence. They think about the card art, the characters, mm -hmm. the, the box. Yeah. At, le at least a good inside, part of it right? is that, yeah. They don't see what's inside. They just they see the box, what's on the mm -hmm. back, what's on the front. That's it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not yet, inside. right? Especially if it's just off the, on the shelf, they see the cover. That's mm -hmm. what... That's yeah. why the cover artists, you know, even in comics, the cover artists are the ones that are more, you typically more famed than the interior artists who may not be the same person, right? So sometimes you get a comic book, yeah. you pick up the cover, you go, oh, that's an amazing cover. You go inside the art and it's like, what? This is a little yeah. bit different than, mm -hmm. this is not the same person. And that's that's mm -hmm. that's kind of how it is. Oh, yeah. yeah, it happens um, in games a lot. You know, you can see a fantastic cover in a, and I've picked up a game and gone, wow, this looks great and turned it over and, the, and you think, what? You know, this is really yeah. different inside what, you know, what's switch. showing on the back cover. Yeah. yeah. I think more and more you'll see that, um, you know, publishers are very aware of that, that they'll hire an artist mm. to do as much of it as possible because that consistency is really, it is part of the experience, right? We are making yeah. curated experiences in a box and we want yeah. that to be the best possible. And sometimes that means shelling out a little bit more so you can hire the artist for the whole thing instead of just the cover. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Concha, do you, uh, do you generally do like the whole game all the time? Because I I found, you know, over the past few years, uh, people just come to me for the cover. You know, um, yeah. sometimes I get to do the whole game, uh, like with a lot of the Talon Strikes games mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that I've done with, with Eric. Uh, you know, I've done the whole thing, so the the cover and a lot of the game components, and then may, maybe later on, you know, if they can't afford me or they're busy or something, they might get someone to do a a piece that could be like the board, right? But yeah. um, lately, lately, a lot of people have just come to me and they've already got their game finished, but they want to cover. Yeah, <laughs> I like, get... well, what about the artist who did all the work? Yeah. I, I feel I, I do get, I have done a few projects where I just did a cover and then there's a different, they asked for a recommendation for an artist to do the insides because I wasn't available to do everything. And I feel like ashamed of those projects. <laughs> not, I mean, not, not actually ashamed. I mean, I wanted to do all of it as, as someone who is a, like a, I'm a, I'm a board gamer first and, and an illustrator adjacently or second, like I, it, it's really important for me some, for a game to visually have a, a presence that is like holistic and completely thought out. Um, so I don't like doing just covers, but it is appealing because it's, 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 I Quick. feel like I'm better at covers than doing components. Um, because I, I, I stumble when it comes to multiple small things and like 60 of them. Um, and of course, everyone wants to do a cover. Um, but I feel like as much as possible, I, I like to take a project and do all the insides, every little bit of it. And even better if it's with Bridget, then like we're like designing everything from the ground up. And it feels like I'm a part of this team from start to finish. Um, mm. I feel like a lot I've got a lot less projects that have come to me finished than in the past. And I've been able to get on projects earlier where they're still doing some ideating or conceptualizing things and they might need an artist, visual, a visual artist at that point. Um, but yeah, I definitely, <clears throat> I, I'm getting, people know that a good cover artist is like a, 
it's a big deal. It's like how your box is going to stand out on the shelf and on, on a website, you know? And on the banners they use at conventions. And I mean, I'm walking yeah. around Gamma Expo at the moment going, ooh, that banner looks great. I'm going to go up and look at the art. And oh, I don't like the way that banner looks. I'm not going to bother. Or oh, they've only got a logo. I'm not going to that place. Yeah. I it's recently actually, like, that I recently had to, uh, I, I, it's a huge game, like a very popular game that I can't speak about. But I, I, said, I said no to it because essentially they had a cover artist already. And they wanted me to do the components, which would have been an amazing gig now, especially like five years ago, even now and any time in the future. But I just I had to really think about it. And 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 I came down to like realizing that uh, I'm not good at components. So so uh, not only uh, is it hard to not be able to do an entire game, including the cover, but like if it's just the components, I feel like there's someone that can do this better than me. And so I should leave that space for someone who can do it better. But well, uh, maybe we should work together sometime because I like doing the little bits and I can oh, I yeah, sure. <laughs> produce a cover in the same way. My cover compositions <clears throat> just never get where I want them. So yeah, but see that even this, that that feels instantly, instantly different cat. Like it's like we're working together. We're like mm -hmm. one artist. We're doing something together. I feel yeah. like a lot of projects are more, they're more broken up and there's like, I don't talk to the artist and that's different. You know, that's, no, that's I don't think that I don't think that's what they did for Wingspan. For example, I think all of those artists were kind of mm. involved together and that's why it, it was so successful and so cohesive. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely part of it. Yeah. They, it's, mm. um, it is, it is like when you get a good art director, who's you know speaking the same language to everybody and really having that kind of overall vision for the product line at the end i think that's when you get really cohesive games and you're right i mean there's the, pick the right person for the right job if you want little itty bitty technical details you know maybe quan chai is not the dude right maybe james is if you want like a cover that doesn't have stuff in the background get quan chai <laughs> the background the background's not like 3d it's not like it's this realistic smear. 3d background right because it's just not quan chai style yeah, it's just yeah. a smear of paint yeah mm. schmears you like schmears <laughs> your man. Yeah, uh, man i have a question about quan chai please um do you, um have you ever been asked to redo a cover yes i have um and almost always because there was too much magenta in it and almost always for a, if it's an it's an American game that I worked for uh, for an American or you know Canadian or U.S. publisher, and then that game is being distributed in Europe, most often through a German distributor, and that German distributor has issues with the cover being too magenta, dynamic, gi yeah, magenta, too much. It needs to be. Uh, they have a different point of sale. They have a different goal for their covers, and I I, I talked at length with. My, my publishers about that and I understand the need but it, it's a it's always a bummer to have to like change a cover because it needs to be toned down a bit you know Quanchai, I'm, oh, yeah, like, I, I find this really I'm gonna design a game I find this really hard. Hard. we're it's gonna hard. work together on it it sounds great sorry well, just for time, it's okay uh, so lots of times I've had a, a client come to me and I, I know I've lost track but I can count at least seven or eight, at least in the last couple of years, uh, uh, where people have come to me and said, you know, we, we had an artist do the cover, uh, but, you know, it's, it's not up to scratch, so could you, like, fix it up? Oh, that kind of reader. Oh, and, and I always feel it. And sometimes they just get really awkward when you get a message from that artist, right? Then they're like, oh, well, you know, I was doing the cover before, and, you know, um, it doesn't look like they, you know, they liked it. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know what, ah, oh, yeah, well, they just sent it to me and I'm going to have a look at it. Um, you know, uh, so I find that really difficult where you know, I'm coming in and, and sometimes it might just be part of the cover. And that was really weird. Like the one I did recently, I just fixed up the woman. Um, it was the chemical overload cover because um, they had all of this stuff done for the background and some of it was a bit, yeah, it was a bit kind of okay, but they, they needed the woman change. So I did that and kind of, you know, it was a, so it's like a dual thing. I find that's really weird. <laughs> when, yeah, when you have like you, you collaborated with the person. Yeah. Feels like you're correcting yeah. them, right? I know. No, and, and personally, in in my um, in my artist terms, I don't allow people to draw on top of my artwork. And I know Vincent Same, doesn't. Yeah. He's very, very much Same. against someone coming along and drawing on top. And I've had this several times where I've given the artwork to a client. And then they've given it to someone and they've added something on top. Um, and this happened recently with the, 
Oh, it was the, the sample box for long pack. So I did the sample box for long pack uh, last year and um, I gave them the cover and um, when, when they sent me the, um, the actual box, I was like, hang on a second, who's, who's drawn meeples in the portholes of the ship? <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and things like that. Um, so I, I always find that, I was just wondering if you've ever come across that situation, Quantra. Yeah, you've, oh, you've kind yeah. Of like Speaking of no-nos, like if, you know, of all the things we've talked about today, you know, <laughs> the one thing that I, as an artist, will never forget uh, whether it's whether it's you know ill meaning, most often it's not. It's not ill meaning. It's 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 schedule wise. Something just had to be done. Usually, right? I'll never forget when someone drew on top of something I drew, and it wasn't talked about. Mm. You know, I have no problem if we talk about it, and it's like, look, I got to draw this thing. I got to add this thing. Is that okay? Fine. But I I can I can count on like one hand the times when uh, someone changed something uh, after the fact without letting me know, and it's like it's it's a real bummer it's a real it sticks out in your mind so um that's in my yeah, yeah. yeah. My word. you cannot you cannot change this Can't yeah change and, well, honestly on top. honestly i i as as much as it, it 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 does incense me to for that to happen to me i've i've i, I just remembered recently I, I was i was working with a friend who's another artist he sent me a drawing and i i long story short i drew on top of his drawing and he was like Hey man, like I don't really. This is not the vibe I'm going for. I'm doing this for fun. So you drawing on top, and I was like, I, I was shocked that how quickly I fell into the, a role that I despise. And I said, I, I am. I sent him a text right away. I was like, dude, I am so sorry. I, I know it's like not supposed to happen that way, and I know what happened. But so you know, conversely, also like especially you know, I'm an artist. I should know better. But especially for people who have no experience with artists and art direction, like. Mm -hmm. It is muddy waters easily, and you can quickly fall into a space where you like you feel like you're collaborating, but in fact you might be stepping on toes. It it yeah. does happen, but yeah, it is like it is mm -hmm. infuriating. So always ask before you sketch on something to yeah. try. And even if even if you're saying, oh, it would be great if this looked a bit more like this, and you're trying to give feedback, is it okay if I just quickly sketch on this what I mean? <laughs> just yeah, do that. Totally. Just do that. It's really easy. Just do that first. <laughs> Yeah. Did you guys see the one? Um, I just did one recently with uh, Fantasia Games, um, Sweet Mess. Sweet has Mess? Has anyone seen the cover? Uh, Sweet Mess. You. Well, it's, sort of, it's gone through like a few iterations. You, you redid the cover? Um, well, you look, yeah, it, I'll call it a collaboration between them. Uh, um, well, so that, that's, I, yeah, that's, a, that's a cover, horror story, so actually. Did. That whole, yeah, that whole game is a horror story. Yeah. Characters and the background. Yeah. Um, and then it caused a whole lot of issues, I believe. Um, and then some things were added afterwards. So then when I saw the final cover, I was like, ah, yeah. Um, yeah, things have been added. You know, it, it, so I think what Quan Chao was saying is um, there's, there's that sort of fine line between stepping on toes and collaborating. You know, you're like, oh, I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Oh, for sure. That that Quan, Quan Chai and I have have some issues with that entire publisher. So that's that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing. It's not. It, it it was. He's not a bad guy. He's a very nice person. It's just it it went south real fast. So anyway, we don't want to darken our doorsteps with talk. Um, do you ever do uncredited work? Uncredited work, huh? Um, that's an oh, interesting no. question. <laughs> That, so, so I've question. done I've done work for Funko games, and when you work for Funko, it's uh, True. it's uh, they're they're and this is up front, so you know it's like they're credited as Prospera Hall, which is the entire design team, and they have an amazing team that I, I visited in Seattle with three, four in-house artists and graphic designers and designers and stuff, and so it was a joy to be lumped in with them, regardless, because Funko games look amazing. Um, so that's the only time I think I was uncredited. Otherwise, I like my name. Unlike unlike James, I like my name to be as huge as possible on every surface. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, I, I get kind of annoyed though. I get I get annoyed when I see, say, artists like Beth Sobel always gets her name on the front cover, right? And um, you know, like when I've done a complete game, I understand if I'm just doing the cover, you know, but I still expect my name on the back somewhere. Uh, but if I've done the whole game and I've done the cover and I've done everything in there, I would expect to see my name on the front. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think even that's if it's what... really tiny, you know, um, it doesn't need to be like jumbo size, but just even if it was just like little, little tiny, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I and sometimes that, I don't get that. That's what Scott Rogers um, was kind of getting at that I think we need to mm, credit the artist as well absolutely. as much. Right? Yeah. Yeah, how can you claim your exposure bugs, Troy? Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. So you know how I was talking about that RPG that I did when I was 17 that I illustrated? Mm. That all got published in everything, and I did not get credited at all. Um, um, yeah, so, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah, that really sucks bad. It's all right. It's an, it, I don't think it did terribly well, but um, you know, it exists out there, and there's no there's no mention of, of me. Yeah, so, it still sucks. First published you know. work. I know, so yeah, because yeah. I think you know, as, as free again as freelancers, we're we're only as good as our last project in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. So we we have to have mm -hmm. that that name recognition is an important thing. Those credits are important things for us uh, because there's no picture you can't point to me in a movie and say, oh yeah, I acted in that movie because I'd be horrible, and a I don't act, and b you know that'd be bad. But you can't point to me. You'd have to like. I'd have to prove to you that I made this game, but if the name is on the box, then therefore I did it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think credit where credit is due is a very important part of of the whole industry, like trying to make sure that people in the industry are getting their fair shake and getting their the recognition they deserve. Does it lead to lots? No, it's a small industry. But uh, does it lead to stuff within the industry? Yes. And I think that's really important. Um Yes, shame to, on anyone who doesn't pay an artist or give them proper credit. Uh, and then we're not even going to talk about AI <laughs> today, are we? Um, how you're credited, this is from Ian O'Toole, should always be part of your contract as well as the right to remove your credit if you wish. Mm -hmm. I think that's a oh, very wow. important part. Uh, we have removed credit mm -hmm. from some of our things because we no longer wanted to be associated with that particular designer or and or publisher yeah, right. or whatever. It happens, right? Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. So these yeah. are important things. Uh, Scott's... Scott's uh thing about yeah uh, that, sorry that was me coughing when i saw scott's um comment there uh, <laughs> about not paying but we won't go into that yeah but yeah um, that's that's an unusual one yeah so being able to remove your credit also yeah mm -hmm. yeah hmm. yeah so there's, there's a lot of things that contractually we kind of have to start thinking about um mm -hmm. the, the world is kind of a different place than it used to be mm. um so any I've last minute the, questions uh, yeah, I sent you Pardon the terms. Me? I sent them to our email because oh, I couldn't perfect. attach them. Okay. Yeah, I emailed them do, to you. Do you mind if I post them um, no, to go ahead. the uh, Meeple Syrup thing? Uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It's sort of it's uh, come about over maybe six years, so it keeps getting rewritten. Um, but have a look at it. You might That's find wonderful. something interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always find it really interesting how other creatives work on their, their contractual obligations and their agreements because, you know, those... They're, they're meant to protect everybody, right? Protect me from, you know, publishers doing shady shit and protect publishers from me not handing in my work. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So it, it goes both ways. And I just want a really good a thing that I can be accountable to and that I can hold you accountable to if, you, if I hired you or if you are hiring me. What are your obligations? Everybody should come out winning in a negotiation. That's That's my logic towards negotiation right it's like what do i give what do i get and if anybody feels like they got ripped off it's not a good contract that's exactly. the bottom line yeah that's yep. fair no oh. one should go out of a contract negotiation cheering and no no one should go out of it crying everyone should go out of it thinking oh, okay yeah exactly um scott rogers or i mean if both people are cheering that's awesome oh yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah sure scott rogers <laughs> asks, where can we see all of your portfolios of work in case we might want to hire you for a Ooh. project so we do have uh james churchill on art station there you go scott that's one for you and uh quan chai is just at quan chai moria at, on all the things on all the things, yeah, except mm -hmm. TikTok. Actually, you know, what I was thinking about maybe, maybe, maybe you guys can chime in. I feel like it would be fun to like do like little short videos on like covers I've worked on and and how I got to the process, yes. the process of them. Yeah, I, yeah. Just, I just actually just today I updated my website. I was like a dozen games behind that I just didn't put on the website, so I put them all up, and I was like, man, there's like some cool stuff here. I feel like I should. Even yeah. just on a personal level, as this therapeutically go back through things and talk about why. Yeah, well, myself, it's, why it's, I, I it's it is interesting to think about. Like process is my favorite thing. It's 
my friends in comics don't love that I wait until the um, you know the bound editions come out because mm-hmm. they they live and die by floppies being sold, right? Yeah. But uh, I keep telling them then stop putting all the cool stuff in the bound edition because <laughs> I I buy the bound editions because they have all the process and I yeah. love reading not only the writing process because I'm a writer, but I read the artistic process and it just gives me that much more of insight into how people create and much more respect. And I, I actually, so uh, the last game from off the pa- off the page games was Harrow County mm-hmm. and uh, Tyler Crook is one of, is the artist for that series. Cullen Bunn is the, is the writer and uh, Cullen and I talk a lot, but I've never really looked into Tyler's process. And because I was reading the, the bound editions, it's like, oh my gosh, look at what this guy does to create these watercolors. So much so that when Jay offered on <laughs> the uh, Kickstarter, and, you know, Jay's my best friend. He's my boy. Uh, I still backed all in for like $575 to get an original piece of art from Tyler Crook because I respected his process so much. That's and I awesome. think that's kind of what happens when you expose people to how much work does it take to create, yes. right? Like, how much work yes. does it take Quan Chai Moria to make that cover or James Churchill to make that cover? That's mm-hmm. where we get that level of respect. That's where we get that level of thing. You know, because like, I can draw, I can paint. I just probably can't do it at the same rate and consistency that you guys do it, <clears throat> right? which is why I'm totally not a professional. I don't want to be a professional, but I can do it. It just takes me thousands of years to do any <laughs> of it, right? I can't, I can't make that output at the same level that Kat and you and James can do it. So... It's like, that's not my bag. I'm not going to do that. So, yeah, Troy is saying, toot your horn, Quan Chai. And the same thing with you, James. We'd love to see your process. And Kat, uh, Kat, I, Kat does put up quite a bit of process. but um, I do time lapses and process and cool. blog posts and all Very kinds of things. I think all that stuff is really, really important. A lot of my favorite comics guys, Quan Chai, they do, and girls, they do Twitch. They just have like a live stream mm-hmm. of Twitch, and they're just talking and drinking coffee and writing or drawing or painting. Mm-hmm. And you sit there and watch them and you chat with them and it's uh yeah. it's a good way to kind of build up that that fan base right yeah you know say no to parasocial relationships but also say yes to fans mm-hmm. it's good yes there you go oh ho, ho. ian o'toole hitting us with some some thunder from down under <laughs> that's right? <some> truth. <laughs> <Yeah>. process <laughs> is the art not just the result love it can we get that on a shirt ian can you make me that shirt I think Ian could make a shirt or two. Pretty sure he knows how. Awesome. Uh, yes. Yes. Ian's in like uh, you're in like Western Australia, aren't you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So greetings from Victoria at the moment. There you go. And um, <laughs> Even Troy so. says that, Troy says that uh, Tatiana, uh, who's another good friend of ours, does process videos and they're great. Tatiana is wonderful. She's like a creator, maker of all sorts of things, artist, um, and she does great process videos as well. Um, Speaking of which, I got a poker because we're we're in we watch anime together and we chat about anime. And so I haven't seen her at anime group for a while. I'm gonna have to like get on her. Um, yes. <laughs> you do not want to see my process video, Scott. Like it'll be like the longest time lapse ever because it takes me forever to do things. So I kind of really <laughs> super do actually, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Really all do. right. I I will I will do a process video for you guys one day. I have four months off because I'm finished teaching as of today. So, Oof. well, there you go. So I could maybe make, it'll take me four months. We want, to the, we want the attack on Titan uh, theme in the background. Okay. That's the Attack on Titans theme song. Okay. I could go forever. I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> excellent well you know what everybody i don't think we can literally go forever it is uh we've been going for about an hour and a half and i know that um for me anyways it is 11 30 it's actually oh no 10 30 it's actually still 10 30 for you too no cat you're not in eastern you're in central are you in central no you're still no, pacific? I'm, I'm pacific this is my first one where it's the same time zone in a while so. i keep forgetting where reno actually is so there you go yeah, 7 30 p.m it's in Nevada. Yes, That's it's twelve thirty noon here, <laughs> right? And it's noon where you are, James. So you're you're like well awake, but I am I am yeah. I'm getting to the the end yes. of my ropes here. So there you go. <laughs> I am doctor. So it is time for lunch. Well, it's been great talking events. with you. Yeah, it was wonderful to talk to you too. So you can find me on socials at Senfong Lim and Cat. Where are you? Um, I'm on at Drink on all the things. You can find us at Meeple Syrup on twitter and quan Shai is 
at right there. Everywhere. On all the things, yeah, everywhere. And James is a little old school, he said, so you can find him on Facebook and on ArtStation specifically, because that's, you know, really the important stuff. Is to they should be art. an ace in that. There should. I'm going to go change that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I knew something was wrong when I looked at it. I said something's wrong, but it all looks right, but it's not. There we go. Updated. Oh, hang on. There's, yeah, there's got to be an S there, right? There is. Yes, there it yeah. is now. See? It's as if, as if cool. it never happened. There you go. I didn't even notice Excellent. that before. <laughs> Me either. Um, so if you like <laughs> what you saw tonight and you'd like to support us some more, give us a shout. Reach out to us. Uh, Patreon.com slash Meeple Syrup. You can support us in whatever way you feel necessary, even if it isn't. <clears throat> so before we leave, uh, I would love if Quanchai and James could give one final piece of advice on how to approach their artists or your artist or an artist. That's a better way to say it. Quanchai, what do you think? Quanchai <laughs> <laughs> was going to uh, pass that gonna think Whatever he was going to say. Um, I saw you. Uh, I feel like, uh, yeah, just as much like over communicating is not a sin when it comes to talking to an artist. I, I, at least at least me as an artist so right before yeah. before before yeah yeah like during get, the process get everything, get everything in the there process. like the kitchen sink in there you know just so we know right i think that's kind of like everybody just wants to know what is the scope of this before i say yes yeah you know don't please 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 please, please anybody out there who's hiring creatives and freelancers please don't throw more stuff at us once we've already you know delivered um like honestly if i've delivered it's done. Like I have no more bandwidth for that because it's, it's, I've booked the rest of my year based on the fact that I delivered what you said I should deliver. If you have problems with it, you should have told me that like, Oh, wait for worse. Once I've agreed, but before it's actually finished, that's, that's also really horrible. Yeah. Like suddenly scope creep. None of that. Yes. Yeah. No scope creep. Say no to scope creep. No. Yeah. Uh, James, what's your final piece of advice? Uh, we'll look, uh, the information that I sent you through in that brief, the uh, the artist yeah. uh, agreement, you're welcome to post any of that stuff because you'll find there's a whole lot of things that I cover that relate to this uh, in that document. But basically... <laughs> Quanchai's is like, when... send that to me privately. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. His eyes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, when I, get a, when I get a message from a client, I really just want to know I really want to know what they want in the in the least amount of um, space. So I want some examples uh, of mood boards of what they're looking for. I want a brief. I don't need to know anything about how the game works. Um, I just need you to, to basically trust me that I'm going to work with you to give you the best thing that I can. So I think trust the artist, whoever you're hiring, whether it's Vincent Dutrade or whether it's Quan Chai or myself or any of the other people who do this for a living, we do this for a living. We, we know what we're doing. So um, please don't micromanage us when we're working. Uh, just, you know, give us the brief, tell us what you want, what the color palette you like, or we can give that to you. Um, and, and just pay us when we need to be paid, because that's yeah. the thing that I struggle with the most is yeah. if I, if I book a client for a week, you know, um, I've got weekly bills, you know, my wife's expecting to go shopping at the end of the week, you know, so if you take three days to get back to me, I've lost three days work um, and I'm not getting paid until next week. And, and there are no groceries you know, this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we got no groceries for the kids, right? So we're we're real people. We you know, we work week to week. Well I do, you know, I, I work on a project to project basis. So it's it's generally week to week. You know, unless mm -hmm. that project spans three or four weeks and then, you know, I, I like to get paid a progress payment at least. Um so yeah, that's it for me. I, um that's pretty much how I like to, to do it. I like to keep it simple and not not be micromanaged. Yeah, Talk to us, trust us, pay us. There you go. Yeah. And uh, last question, yep. uh, Matt, one of my students, is asking, so should any number of touch-ups, elements edited should be discussed beforehand? And yes, that that is that is 100% like a not negotiable thing after it's been negotiated. <laughs> like we negotiate up front, but once we've signed that paper, like, boof, that's it. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't have time for edits. That's an editor's job, right? If I've written you something and you signed off on it, it's not my job anymore to fix it. It's your editor, your editor, hire an editor. Same thing with art. If you have graphic design and you said, hey, make me a card frame and you have two passes at it to give me like some feedback. If I've designed that card frame for you and you've given me the two passes, my third submission to you is it. That's it. It's final. Boof. 
And anything extra can be negotiated, but it's past, it's outside of the scope of the contract. It's that's a whole new that, contract. Yeah. That's the thing that people have to understand. So thanks, Matt. Um, so let's just talk about what is coming soon and then we'll say goodbye. So coming soon, next week we have a host panel. Hey, Scott Morris is coming with, to us from Lucky Duck. And we'll also have Fertessa Elise and VJ Bell. Bell. Come, yes. Uh, <laughs> on what publishers want. So we're coming coming at this from the opposite side next week. We're going to grill Scott to say, hey, what do publishers want from designers when designers are pitching or from artists when artists are showing their portfolio or any of that kind of stuff? What's happening on May 10th, Kat? We've got Rebecca Fordyce, Glenn Alcock, Jennifer Kretschmer, um, who will be talking to us about accessibility in general and in game design specifically. That's right. And on May 17th, we have something that has yet to be determined. I don't know what we're going to do no, there, but it'll be, it'll be awesome. It'll be awesome. It'll all be in magenta. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Quatch eyes in. <laughs> and what's happening on the 24th, Kat? Um, so we have the awesome LaMarcus Shepard, who is into um, trading card game design and content creation. And um, I really like his particular angle on that and his energy. So that's going to be a really good one to watch, especially if you don't know anything about trading cards or trading he card will... games. I'm sorry, they're different. Yeah, he will 100% pass the vibe check. There we go. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for, for hanging out with us for the last 95 minutes, 96 minutes now. We will 97. see you all later. Have a great time at Gamma, Kat. Quan Chai will see you, you at Gen Con. James, do you ever get over here on this side of the pond ever at all? No, yes. No, I don't make enough money to travel. What are you talking about? Come on. Uh, all right. Well, <laughs> maybe maybe one day we'll get down. We'll I, there is a convention on, on the Gold Coast that I've been meaning to go to. So. Yeah, look, yeah, I'd love to come. I love Canada. I love uh, I'd love to visit America. So yeah, hopefully we can get over there one day. One day, it'll be awesome. All right, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you soon. Thanks.